stretch. If you want to dramatically improve your quality of life, get that bleach out and go to town on your toilet. This is photography day number one. The beauty of learning photography is not just figuring out how to take a pretty shot of a pretty thing. It's the confidence and the ability to understand what went into that image. It's the ability to see what the aperture was set at, the shutter speed and the ISO. Wait, what? We want to, as craftsmen, be able to compose a shot that is the best it could be. And that means starting from the ground up. And the only way that's possible is if we have complete control, this guy. So we break out these when we want to capture light bouncing off of objects in the universe. This is a DSLR camera. DSLR means digital, single, lens, reflex. So basically what happens with DSLR is this. The image is being captured by light. The light is bouncing off of that subject and going into the lens. The lens has a certain aperture. It goes into the body of the camera and there's a little reflective mirror. And so it bounces off of that mirror and goes up. When it goes up, it hits a prism. And from that prism, it goes to the viewfinder. So you then look through the viewfinder and see what this is capturing. That's DSLR, Digital Single Lens Reflex. A mirrorless camera does away with that whole reflective thing. All that happens is the light hitting the subject bounces off and goes into the lens and goes directly onto a sensor. That sensor processes things digitally and spits out an electronic viewfinder. So you actually look at what's hitting the sensor in real time. Lastly, a smartphone is basically just a lens and a sensor. But what they all share, for the most part, is what we call a CMOS sensor. CMOS. CMOS stands for Complementary Metal Oxide Semiconductor. Using CMOS technology, every single pixel on your sensor convert what's coming in as light into some digital means. And that digital representation of the universe is what you see when you look through your pictures on your phone. So the question that everyone asks is, why don't we just use smartphones for professional pictures? Why do we need to use a big camera? If they have the lens and the sensor, it's all we really need, right? Wrong. You can't really control the exposure that goes into the lens of the smartphone camera. And they're getting more sophisticated as time goes on. And maybe one day we will see small form factor professional quality cameras. It stifles your creativity to only use something that has a lens and a sensor with no controls. That's what you're here for, right? For more exposure, let's talk about light. Exposure is how much light is allowed to hit the sensor of your camera. We use a thing called an aperture to modify how much light goes in and hits the sensor. Aperture is one of the big three. Triglazo, the holy trinity, the triumvirate, the triune. You get the picture. All great things come in threes. Aperture, shutter speed, ISO. What are those? Let's start with number one, aperture. Aperture is a circular collection of blades, like a cigar slicer or something from your nightmares. And these blades move to a certain size and create a certain hole size depending on how they overlap. And that hole size determines our depth of field and how much light is allowed in. Oftentimes photographers use the phrase wide open to describe an aperture that allows a lot of light in. When this happens, there's a large opening which allows a lot of light to pour into the camera and hit the sensor. Have you ever played Portal? Yeah, so aperture science actually started by making curtains for your shower. You ever notice that when you're playing that game, the boxes come out of those, those tubes, those little round openings that shrink like this in circular form, in little blades. That door that allows the boxes to come out, that's an aperture. I know, your brain is steaming up right now. It's like a valve was opened. It's like you've gone through a portal in time. Aperture loosely defines how much brightness or darkness you get from your picture. Aperture also, and most importantly, specifies the depth of field for the image. Depth of field is how sharply you can see an object in focus and how blurry the other things in the background appear. Note, asterisk, 
This is the most critical thing you can focus on as a beginner, because when you get started with your aperture focus, when you actually start understanding how to create different looking images using aperture, different f-stops, that's what we call them, f-stops, that's when you really start to elevate yourself in skill. So we can start here when it comes to exposure. We can start with aperture, we can start with the f-stop settings to get an idea for how to get a bright or dark picture only with this setting without touching any other setting on the camera. For example, if you're shooting in manual mode, the image might be way too bright, like holier than heaven bright, like so bright you can't see Jesus's portrait. You can reduce the aperture, you can make the hole smaller, to let less light in. We have values for this, these f-stops. We don't just arbitrarily say big hole, small hole, wide open, narrow. Sometimes we do. Aperture is measured in what we call f-stops. F-stops? You make your own gang sign. These f-stops are essentially how far these blades are allowed to overlap and close toward that small hole. So. If you have a greater number of f-stops, that you can you can kind of think of it as like, well, I have all of these blades closing, and the more stops they go through, the closer they get to making a small, small hole. And if you have only a couple stops, so a very small number of f-stops, you can think of it as just barely getting started toward closing. Okay, so it's a road trip for these blades until they cut you off. So again, the more stops, the more f-stops, the more closed that hole becomes loosely. If you want something bright, if you want a, a more, if you want more exposure, choose a wide open aperture. In other words, make the hole bigger by having fewer f-stops so that those blades aren't closing. If you want something that's already really bright to be a little bit darker, you can close the gap and you can increase the amount of f-stops so that those blades are going closer and closer to that hole and create a smaller opening. And that might, but most cases will, reduce the brightness of the image. Now let's talk about depth of field when it comes to aperture. Depth of field is how blurry the background appears to be beyond the focus of the subject. So if you have, for example, a wide open aperture, if you have a low f-stop count and the hole is open wide and you're allowing a lot of light to come in, it's a very shallow depth of field. So the background is going to appear very blurry. You're gonna get a brighter image and you're also going to get something in the foreground very focused and everything beyond that is going to become very blurry very quick. This is great for portraits and headshots because you really wanna focus on the subject. You wanna focus on that person and their eyes or their face, and you don't really care about the fact that someone's eating a tomato raw in the background next to a bus stop. Number two, shutter speed. A shutter is just like what you would find outside of a window. It's those things that you can turn like this. In this case, the shutter actually covers the sensor. So the aperture, the device that goes into that closed circle orientation, that's different. That you find on your lens. That's kind of the first stop. The next, right before the sensor is this shutter. And it's the only thing that completely closes. The aperture doesn't really completely close. You still need some kind of light to come in. So it, it gets to a really small hole, but it doesn't close completely. The shutter is the last chance to completely shut down that light. So it shuts off that light, no more coming in, not for you today, no sir. It shuts it off, and so you get whatever you took before that shutter came down, right? Now that shutter comes down at a certain speed. So for example, if I were to take a picture of this situation right now, if I went that slowly, you would get a lot of blur. Everything that's happening, for example, all of those finger movements would be captured as the shutter is coming down and the light is gonna get cut off here. But from the moment it started to the moment it stopped, you're getting all of this motion. That's why having a slow shutter speed allows a lot more blur. If you're gonna do sports photography, you wanna have a super, super blindingly fast shutter speed speed because shutter speed, you want a blindingly fast shutter speed, 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 because then you're not gonna get blurry. If they're taking a basketball shot, you're gonna get them taking the basketball shot with as much accuracy to that as possible. Otherwise you get blur. So the speed of the shutter is measured in fractions of a second. In some cases, you can extend the shutter speed to seconds for long exposure creative shots like star swirling and things like that, all those romantic stock images that you have on the internet, 
Some of those were taken with this kind of slow shutter speed to allow those stars and the rotation to be measured that way. Just keep in mind that if you have a really bright environment and you have a slow shutter speed, you're gonna bleach the image really quickly because you're letting photons slam into the sensor. So what you're gonna find is that past number one, aperture, you're gonna hit number two, shutter speed. And I find that the shutter speed quickly denotes how much brightness and darkness. If you're taking pictures of things that are stationary, you don't really worry so much about the shutter speed when it comes to blur, but you do worry about shutter speed when it comes to the brightness. So if you're taking landscape photography and you're in manual mode and you're trying to get a good picture of everything in the distance, first of all, your aperture, right? That's probably gonna be set to something squint-like, small hole to get all the way into the detail of the background. So if that's small hole, then you're gonna have a lot of f-stops, which means that you're going to have a deep depth of field. Now you've gone that far, you've done that well, and now you go to number two, and you notice even though you've set your aperture correctly, you can't see a thing. That's because your shutter speed is too fast, okay? So it's too dark. So you slow down your shutter speed and allow more light to come in. And when you do that, because the background, the mountains aren't really changing all that much, at least not from this, from this distance maybe, you're gonna get more of that light bouncing off of the mountain and eventually making its way to the camera. So you allow it to stay open, hopefully with a tripod, because you'll find that a slower shutter speed will blur up when you have your hand held. So beware, when you're shooting and experimenting with shutter speeds, the slower your shutter speed, the blurrier it will be when you're shooting handheld. The faster it is, the better it will be while you're holding the camera's body. That brings us to number three, ISO. ISO is funny because it means nothing. I'm not kidding. It means the International Standardization of Understanding. No, ISO means the International Standard of Organization. It means nothing. Basically, it tells you whether you're working with a boomer or a millennial. And I say that because us old timers, us wrinkly folks, we call it ISO, but the new kids call it ISO. This is the biggest deal ever. We use ISO as a placeholder for onboard software that digitally increases the brightness or darkness levels. Now, the thing with this is that by increasing the ISO, you are also increasing the chance for digital distortion, this digital grain, what we call noise. No, I'm not talking about that whistling sound you hear in your ear nonstop. I'm talking about digital noise. It's that grainy texture you see on pictures taken with flip phones from the early 2000s. ISO basically makes your camera more or less sensitive to light. The note here is that it's a digital solution, not a physical one. ISO is a compensation for very dark situations or exceedingly bright situations. And managing the ISO level can determine a noisy image from a clean and natural looking one. Use this last. ISO values are the most straightforward of all of them. The lower the ISO value, in other words, ISO 100, 200, 400, 800, whatever, the smaller the number, the darker the image will be or appear. The higher the ISO value, the brighter or more exposed or washed out or saturated the image will appear. So be careful when working with ISO because you can introduce digital noise. When you do work in Lightroom or other software on your computer, you'll also find this digital noise come out whenever you're making edits. And if you go too harshly in one direction, you introduce a lot of this digital artifact. So that's it. Day number one is to get those three main things, the aperture, the shutter speed, and the ISO. Once you have your brain wrapped around those three concepts, you can actually get started on the camera to being a better photographer. You're on your way to being a better artist. And most importantly, you're on your way to having more fun and engaging your creativity. Cheers, have fun.